preached and talked to hundreds of people who wanted the Christ life but did not want freedom. They wanted the fullness of Christ, but they didn't want freedom. The reason for this is that our doing and our working has become a security to us. I found that most anybody would take on Christ if you didn't tamper with their security. That's kind of where we are now, talking about this matter of us reaching others with the gospel. We're really a little scared because we don't want our security tampered with. We'd like to do something for God. Maybe I'm like this. I've thought about this uh, over the weekend. Am I like that? Because I've adjusted myself that I never had to carry another mortgage that I could just preach and teach a message. But it hasn't worked that way. And so I thought, well, am I adjusted to my security so much that I don't want to move on for God? I had to search my heart before I'd say, this is what we're going to do. Security. It's a pillow. Linus. Security pillow. We'd like to have a miracle if it didn't put a demand on us. Good thing about Jesus, you can get miracles without a demand. You know that already. He heals people. He heals sinners, no demand on them. The lethargic, the indifferent, get miracles. Scripture speaks about those who are bewildering to the believers because they get so many blessings from God and believers sometimes don't get them. No demands. But on the other hand, if there's no demand, there's no commitment. If there's no commitment, there's no life change. So painfully, Jesus finally said in John 12, though I've done all these miracles, yet they do not believe. So it's possible that we really don't want our security-based touch. We just want everything we can get from God. I'd like to have a miracle, but I don't want the exchange life. Now that's where Christianity is. That's where all these faith people are right now. I'd like to have health and prosperity. But when you talk about binding me, to Jesus. Nope. They don't know that being bound to Jesus is the only freedom. Because only when you know the truth are you set free. So truth becomes something we have to know and understand. What is truth? I had to weigh that before I took this step to say, I'm going to do that. Now, I may not get it done, but I'm going I'm to work at it because I feel led of God. Uh, I feel led of the Christ in me is what I ought to say. I ought to quit using God like that. I feel led by the Christ in me to do what I'm going to do. And the Father says, go to it, son. Whatever you're big enough, do it. So I had to weigh this issue of did I really want my security tampered with? Because I could knock along like I'm going now. I don't make any money, but I live, and I enjoy what I'm doing. Oh, I love to talk about Jesus, and I love to meet with now hundreds of people across the nation every month. That's a thrill. And I don't meet with them on any other level other than the Word. Oh, what a thrill. I would like to close out my days like that. But here I see I'm not meeting the need. The Christ in me is not even meeting the need he wants by me. So I have a wrestling match. And so at that point, I'm involved in my security. feel real good right now. don't want any heavier load. My heavy load has been how to get there and back. So I'm talking about a different kind of load. Do I want my security involved? Would I let it be shaken up? Truth becomes a person. And this is what I weighed. Christ is truth. If I believe this truth, then I won't worry about anything else. No concern about anything else. The truth sets me free to do what it is I want to do. 
So what becomes an issue to the believer is how to test truth. How do we really test whether or not the thing we're getting involved in is truth? How do you know it's true? You say, well, you know it if it sets you free. But freedom to me is not being free of responsibility. Freedom to me is being free to where I don't have to be concerned or worry about my salvation. I know who I am. That's freedom. But then I wonder, would I let God take away the security that I have now? Am I willing? Am I willing to let him tamper with that? Do I have enough trust in him that, that I have truth and that truth has set me free so that I can follow the call of my heart and the spirit of Christ within me? So I had to weigh that. I had to weigh that in the last few days. Because if I get a, if we get a, a retreat somewhere like Colorado Springs, then I've got to put my life into it. I've got to move there. I've got to upset everything that uh, closes out my days on this earth and bite it off as if I was 21 again. See, that, that's what I face. Because it's, it's, it's not just going to drop in my hands. God isn't like that. Life comes out of death and nobody knows it better. <coughs> so the life of that thing is going to come out of the death of me. I have to weigh that. So I had to test what is truth. If it's truth, it sets me free. So what am I going to do with this Jesus that's in me? Well, that becomes a big issue. Well, I reverted back to some of my psychological training because that gave me some terms I want to talk to you about. I, in fact, want to talk to you about uh, nine or ten terms. And I want you to have a feeling for them because you sit here listening to me and you may not know exactly what I mean by Christ is our truth. I have truth because truth is a person. Because when I mention the very term truth, your immediate reaction is truth is a collection of ideas that are irrepressible, irrevocable. They stand. That's something I know to be absolute. That's what, that's what truth is. Truth is this absolute thing. No. What I already talked to you about here is that truth is when your outer knowledge corresponds with your inner. Now, if you separate the person out of that and go down to what you know, you may be in the knowledge of good and evil. So you can't separate the person from that. And I know you may not be catching this, so let the Holy Spirit teach you later. It's when your outer knowledge corresponds with the inner that you have truth. Only when you have that truth are you free. That's the only time you're free. The rest of the time you're in bondage. That's why people who set under law preaching are never free. They are never free. Sooner or later, the truth that is preached to them comes to them in the light that you must do thus and that to make this truth work. At that point, it's law and no life in it. So truth is when the outer knowledge meets the, the inner knowledge. And there are some words that might help you to define or understand what is truth. You remember Pilate said that in the presence of him who was truth. And I've always suspicioned that it is the very opposite of what most men think Pilate said. Because Jesus didn't really answer him, but told him, uh, you see me, did somebody tell you this or did you come to know it yourself? In other words, Jesus said, because I'm standing in your presence, there is a gravitational pull in your mind that's wondering what truth is. That's the way it is with this person, Christ. What is truth?
One of the words that we have to talk about is the word instinct. You cannot test the truth by instinct. If Christ is truth and truth is a person, you cannot test the truth by instinct. What is instinct? Instinct is the natural ability which causes us to some unpremeditated action. Instinct. It's what causes us to do something we don't think about. We just spontaneously, automatically do it. I don't want you to confuse instinct with spontaneous living, however. They're two different things. Instinct is something that is built into you, that comes naturally in you, the I part. Spontaneous living is when the I part recognizes Jesus no longer as specific, but recognizes him as all. In other words, spontaneous living is not when you say, I think Jesus would do this. It's when you go ahead and do this and know it's Jesus. That's spontaneous. <clears throat> Instinct is that thing that is natural within us, that causes us to do naturally automatic things. It's like a pigeon. If you take it away from its roost, it'll come back. That's instinct. Uh, we, got, we got religious people who have instinct. When the bell rings at 9.45 every Sunday morning, uh, they have guilt to grip them if they're not there, and they feel bad about all the rest of them that didn't show up at that time if they are there. Uh, it's sort of an instinct. Instinct is the, the mother robin who builds her nest. Uh, we had a dumb pigeon at our place. I got wife brought home a couple of pigeons years ago. And boy, I got so many pigeons now, I don't know what to do with them. And we had a dumb one. She was dumb. She got in a rain gutter to build her nest. She decided that she was going to lick that rain gutter. <laughs> now, instinct, I watched this. Instinct caused her to make countless hundreds of trips picking up twigs and leaves to build that nest. And she would put them in that gutter but they would never hold together or stick because the slightest wind or rain and the thing was gone. But here she came back again. She was determined to lick that gutter. Instinct kept her building that nest, but the CNS gang wouldn't let it. So instinct is not the same as truth. If you instinctively feel something, it may not be truth. It may not be the reality which, which you need. It isn't a test for faith because instinct may not legitimately discern the difference between what is innate in your creation and what you acquired. You may not be able to tell the difference between the two. So you can't go by instinct to know the truth. It is an instinct that sets you free. And yet multitudes of people operate off of that certain feeling and, uh, of instinct. Now how do we know the difference between what it is is innate within us and what we acquire? How do we know that difference? Difference is in the mind. You can do something for so long a period until you acquire the habit of it. For instance, like typing on a typewriter. You can learn typing until it is very normal to type to where you don't know the difference between typing being a natural instinct or an acquired instinct because you just sit down and do it. I see people do that with a piano. I have trouble in anything having that quality. I can't think of anything that is natural to me that is also acquired. Maybe talking, I don't know. But you can't go by instinct. Instinct does not help you to discern what is truth. 
just because it feels good and works normal and natural. For instance, I found people instinctively trying to follow the Lord, and it never worked out. I'd meet them back door of my church, and they'd say to me, oh, you know, this is really the kind of thing I like. It just fits me. Well, I come to find out later that that was usually very temporary. Whatever it was that fits them was constantly changing. So what they had instinctively did not discern what is truth. Let's go to another word. A word is custom. Custom. Custom is a habit or a practice which comes to be associated with things that we believe, certain things that we believe. It's things that we have believed over a long period of time that we make a custom out of. We say about somebody, well, this is their custom to do this. Uh, we have a couple of ladies in our neighborhood, and it's their custom every evening to walk. And you can, you can plan it right by the clock. They have done it so long that uh, even when it's raining, they do it sometimes. It's their custom to do that. By long continuance of doing something, it becomes a custom. Sometimes it's hard to break customs. We have a custom immediately saluting the flag or honoring the flag of the United States when we're near it. That's a custom that's been ingrained in us by a long uh, period of time. Uh, some folks have the custom of going to church on Sunday. That becomes custom, you see. You cannot depend on custom, however, to determine what is truth. Just because you did it a long time, just because you did it a certain way does not mean that it's true. I always remember an experience I had in Korea one time uh, of the little elderly woman they brought to me who had bound feet. She had diseases, and I immediately discerned by the spirit that anybody would have diseases that cut all the circulation off in their foot. That's how most of those people died. They died with diseases because they'd cut circulation off in their foot. So I said through the interpreter, I said, I won't pray for her unless she allows those feet to be unbound. Well, I'd stepped on her sacred cow, and she wasn't about to do that. She wasn't going to unbind those feet because the custom was foot binded. It's bad. It's harmful. It wasn't good for the health. And she was dying with her diseases, many of which would stop immediately if she'd allow proper circulation in her feet. She wouldn't do it. It's custom. So custom cannot determine what is truth. Just because you do it, just because you do it often, just because you do it regularly, custom. I was thinking about this, about our dear brother back here who's 95 years of age. And he said something when I was talking to him a while ago. He says, I'm doing all right, feel good because I work every day. See, that's good. He's, he's active. He stays busy. Uh, you can break that custom and fall apart. A good percentage of people when they retire start downward and are dead. I think the statistics was within 18 months a good percentage of retired people are dead. Well, custom is good in that respect, but custom is not a way by which we determine what is truth. Because you can break custom, you can, you can stop it, you can in, in, in inter, interlude it with something else, so to speak has to be something outside of what we do regularly, even though it feels good, even though we like it, even though it fits. You, you can't allow custom to determine what is true. But to uh, hurry along here, another important term is the term tradition. Tradition. Tradition cannot determine truth. Tradition is customs that have been handed down from early times. Not true. You know something important about Christ in us? You can't hand it down. Now, I love, for instance, the Episcopalian people, but they have one real drawback for me in that they believe their birth children are birth Christians. 
I don't think you can hand that down. I think every Christian must come to know God on his own. I don't think the church can protect its Christians even though you traditionally accept everything in the church. I don't think husbands can protect wives. I think the wife must stand on her own before God. I don't think parents can protect children. The children are going to have to come to know God on their own in time. So tradition can be a great hindrance because traditions can be handed down to so many people for so long that they're all fooled. Absolutely fooled. I dealt with a man here last week who said, well, I would come to Christ Life meetings, but he said, I really don't feel like I've been to church unless I go to my church. For he said, I love the creed. I love to say the prayers. He said, this is my tradition. But he didn't have truth by that. Tradition keeps you from the truth, and tradition does not help you to test the truth. Now, truth will in time establish tradition, but never does tradition establish truth. It is traditional for us to sit in this room and say that our interest in Christianity is the same as the Apostle Paul, that it pleased God to reveal his son in him, and that's the heart of our matter, that it's pleased God to reveal the son in us. That's traditional. Well, truth establishes tradition, but never does tradition establish truth. Another word. Consensus. Consensus. That's the vote. Let's vote and see if this thing is right. Consensus is what is believed by all present, which seems to be foolproof. We have a consensus of opinion. Well, you can't do that with truth. Truth is a person. Now, uh, we say speak the truth. That's something else. That's not this Bible truth I'm talking about. Or else we'd say speak Christ because Christ is truth. Uh, we say, well, every cult says, well, we have the truth. We're the only ones that have the truth. And that's a consensus of opinion to them. But truth is a person not to be voted on. It's to be experienced. He is to be experienced. So I'm going to tell you something. Every one of us are experiencing truth line upon line and precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. So that in the Christ life, we'll never say we have all of the truth. We have the only truth, but we don't have all in our expression. We have all of the truth in Christ in us. But our expression or union is bringing him out line upon line and precept upon precept. <coughs> so we have to forsake the term consensus. <coughs> you can't go by corporate judgment to know what is of God. Uh, you can't look around and say, well, look at all these people who believe this. Can't all be wrong. Sure they can. <laughs> Sure they can. They can all be wrong. Politicians say, well, everybody go and vote, and whoever wins is the right one. No, they could all be wrong. You can't go by what men believe. Do you know that it's only been back, what, 1492, that the whole world thought that the earth was flat? One fellow that was smart believed it. Another fellow confirmed what he believed. And another fellow somewhere else in the world confirmed what he believed. And it wasn't long until the whole gang believed the world was flat. And not a one of them knew what they're talking about. So, you know, you can't go by, by what they believed. I read something the other day somewhere that uh, started up in New England uh, about over 300 years ago or so, whenever it was that they believed that every old woman 
that acted queerly was demon possessed. Well, that'd be an awful thing if we just had every woman act queerly was demon possessed. But that's what they thought. And they put some of them to the stake and burned them. I mean, killed them. Uh, protesting, they didn't know anything about the devil, but that was, a, that was a thing that everybody believed. How do you test the truth? You can't test it by what everybody believes. So I want to say something very important to you. Don't take the Christ life by our numbers, by our faithfulness, or whatever you see that might be good, and sure, don't take it by anything that don't look good. You must experience Christ on your own. You must experience it. I can say right off why most preachers do not preach Christ. They have never had a revelation of Christ. You know, it's, it's painful to say that because of who am I to judge. But if they had a revelation of Christ, you could never argue the point that he's all. Amen. See, that's, that's what the Word teaches. That's what the Word says. So we can't go by consensus. Everybody could be wrong. That's the way I feel about the issue out here now. I think the issue with uh, Jim Baker and, and Jimmy Swaggart is that they had the wrong doctrine. I knew that years ago. I knew the denomination I was in didn't have the right doctrine. And we were bound together by things other than, than what is the doctrine. But I'm seeing it work out now when I hear men say that what I believe doesn't set me free. So you must have the wrong doctrine. If you have the truth, it sets you free. If you have Christ, you're set free. Consensus. That's certainly not it. Uh, number... Five for words is perception. Now, it's good to have deep perception. That's especially good when you, when you get into the Scriptures and you listen to what it is the Lord says. But you know how we receive perception? It comes from the senses. We perceive. You perceive through what you hear, you feel, you taste, you touch. That's the way perception works. You can never come to know what is truth by perception. Uh, it is sense knowledge that comes by acquisition. That's perception. Sense knowledge that comes by acquisition. It's like a blind person. A blind person has tremendous sense knowledge. They, they learn by touching certain things that it feels the same way all the time, but they might not have the slightest idea what that is. But they know by their senses what this thing feels like or tastes like, what its touch is like. So we have acquisition knowledge that you acquire by perception against reflective knowledge. What is reflective knowledge? That's what you have learned over a period of time that doesn't come by the senses but has been secured in you by reflection, by the past. What our senses see, hear, feel, taste, and touch is not a test for faith. Now, a lot of us came up through a religion that was very emotional so that we determined the reality of things by the emotion. Uh, we walked into a building and we used to say, oh, I feel the presence of God in this building. Mm. Or we walked into a place we didn't like and said, oh, it feels so cold and must be the devil in this place. <laughs> Perception. Mm. Perception. How can you feel the birthing? How can you feel the implementation of the seed? How can you feel the new creation life in a body? You don't feel that. It's what you know because it didn't come by perception or experience. It came by believing. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So this happens on the strength of believing something. Believing. So you won't gain the knowledge of truth through perception. That's why I can't come to you and lay hands on you and you have a certain acquired feeling that adds to your faith. 
You know what the laying on of hands is in the scripture? Simple definition for laying on of hands is transfer of faith. I can't transfer faith to you about the Christ life. So honestly, there is no perception that comes by feeling to where you know this thing is so. And I think I need to cause you to really think about that because I'm sure we have some people who have come out of parts of religion where they keep sitting here waiting to feel something. I'm going to really feel something. I'm going to really get a hold of it. You can't go by your senses. And that brings us to the next word that uh, uh, should be considered, and that's the word feeling. As, as, uh, as separate from our senses where we perceive something to where in our heart we feel something. Feeling is a faculty of the soul by which somebody has an inward impression of the state or of something, a certain feeling. Hunch. You have a hunch. That's a feeling. <clears throat> I had a bad feeling about that person. That's most people's reaction to me, you know. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to hear him anymore. Uh, I had a good experience uh, in Sacramento uh, last Monday night. A young man sitting there and he said, well, I, I, I got to tell you that the first time I ever heard you, I got up and walked out of the room and said, that's of the devil. He's a good assembly of God boy. But he said, I want you to know God didn't let me forget what you said. And he said a couple of years have gone by, and that's the first time I'd, he'd been in a meeting since then. And he said, I want you to know God has given me a revelation that Christ is my life. I mean, he came right out and said the right words in the right way. So you, you may get a very bad feeling about somebody. And do you understand this is why we strongly stress I see Jesus in you. I can't take a chance on having a feeling about you. I was in a meeting not long ago. Rob and I was there. And when we left the meeting, it was a bad meeting in, in spirit. Uh, I didn't know whether they were mad at me or God or what, what the trouble was, but the whole room was engulfed. And when we walked out of it, Robbie said, did you feel that? I said, yeah, there was something strange there, but you said, I said, you know what we must do? She said, I know. We must see Jesus in every one of those people. Why? I can't leave that place evaluating it by what I felt. It was bad. They really were not on the right wavelength or something, but uh, we don't gauge people by that anymore. Don't you wish everybody would look at you like that? <laughs> Somebody often comes to me and says, well, did, wasn't you mad the last time you was here? That irritates me. I wish they'd seen Jesus in me instead of what I was expressing. See? That, that was the heart of Christianity. The heart of Christianity is that we see Christ in each other. You know what difference that would make in the church if I saw Jesus in you? That would mean if we came to a point that we utterly disagreed, we would hug each other, say, I see Jesus in you, and walk away from the disagreement. That's the way I want to live. Amen. That's why I've never wanted to get back into being uh, bound by organizationalism. Because if I have a young man that walks with us that sees something different, I want to be able to hug his neck and say, I see Jesus in you. Go do what you want to do. But if we're all bound up in organizationalism and, and uh, money and binding things, then we can't walk away from each other in that spirit. We have to finally prove to each other we're right and hurt each other. See what I mean? We don't want that. We don't want that in this fellowship. A fellow came to me not long ago that had one of our groups, and he said, I, uh, I feel led to do something else. I said, good, go do it. He said, you mean just like that? I said, just like that, go do it. He said, what about you? I said, I'm all right. 
I see Jesus in you. I want to leave it like that. I don't want to argue and fuss with you over this issue. Just go. Well, he was mad because I wouldn't fuss with him. <laughs> it upset him. He had to have it out. I said, I won't do it. I won't have it out with you. You feel led to do something else, do it. We're not building kingdoms of our own, so right. I can do without you. You can do without me. Let's love each other and leave that in our mind, and you go do what you feel led of God to do. I've told you before, I'll love you, but I don't have to work with you. See, I was raised for years in law that said you got to straighten out every little detail or it isn't Christ. This Christ, I see Jesus in you. If we don't agree and can't walk together, you go do what you do as Christ, and I'll do what I do as Christ. And I will not spread this filth that there's something wrong with us. Just see Jesus in you. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could do that? What if that had been done all through the ages? You know, we wouldn't have 10%. We'd only have about 10% of the churches we got now, one per, don per don denomination. But instead, we fussed and argued until I'm going to take my money over here and do something and prove to you we're right. So they start another church. See, that's the way religion went. We'll just start another church. We'll show you. And they went for 30 years and never spoke to each other. No wonder the world didn't want Jesus. They couldn't see him. Oh, so we can't go by feeling. Uh, number seven, the word is oops, intuition. Now that's a good word. Intuition will not judge what is truth. Intuition is basically the, sort of like the eye of the soul, which sees instantly something about humans or things. But without a balance of the word, intuition won't work. It won't test truth. Intuition, a woman's intuition. I've learned to listen to it, and my wife at least. It's, it's pretty right. The way God made women, they have an intuition about things very often. But intuition takes us back to the little diagram between Christ our wisdom and the outer word. Christ our wisdom is spiritual intuition. Wisdom, as we've taught you before, is first thought. That's intuition. Intuition in the spirit is first thought. First thought you have in a matter is spiritual intuition. But it doesn't work unless it's confirmed by the outer word. That's what we tried to, to uh, bring about here. It must have the balance of the word of God. That's why you need to search the scripture daily. Live in the word. Honor the word. Cause the word to be the means by which you judge all things. And I want to give you another word. Number eight is correspondence. Now, that may be a new term to you. Correspondence is when our ideas correspond to reality. This cannot judge truth because that which is of God is not of this world. So you cannot correspond the things that are in this world with spirit truth. Now, we have a thing in uh, 1 Corinthians 2 where the apostle said that the natural man discerneth not the things that be of this world. What that is is a correspondence act where he cannot take the things of God and correspond them to the world and judge what is truth. You understand that? You cannot judge truth that way. Now, what's happened in our modern church is that the modern church is given to improving the third dimension, and so everything they preach has to fall into the uh, regimen of the world. It, why preach over their heads? I used to be 
taught in school that why preach a sermon over their head? Why, why give them something from the outer world? Make it, make it plain how they can live here today in this world. Well, there's nothing in this world that'll make a difference in our life. Now, I know you don't like that statement. You probably think right now, well, if I had plenty of money, that'd make a difference. No, you'd need it again. It really wouldn't make a difference. It'd just make you know how much you need more. So you cannot take the things of God and correspond them to reality. I'm the first to tell you that the message of the Christ life does not correspond to reality in that Jesus is so uh, visible and real to me that I'm a, a better earthling because of it. I know that I have eternal life in me. I know that Christ is my spirit life. And it doesn't correspond to earthly things. The message isn't earthly. It's, it's heavenly from another dimension. Our idea of religion may never correspond with the Christ that's in us. So you have to keep moving. You understand what happens to us? We keep moving from church to church and belief to belief until we finally find that truth that corresponds with the Christ in us. See, that's when you have truth. That's when you can test the truth because you know what you're hearing is what it is Christ in you is saying. Somebody tells me that and they're a Jehovah Witness. I say, okay, stay there. But we're going to test the truth in time. Unless you become brainwashed, we must, we'll test this truth and see what happens. In time, that, that thing they're hearing from the outer does not correspond with the Christ that's in them. Does not correspond. And you know, I believe there are Jehovah Witnesses may be born again. Like there are Jews born again. There are Mormons that are born again. Uh, what their problem is that they will not be able to test that they really have the truth until that outer word is shut off that does not correspond with the Christ within them. If there's no affinity with Christ within you, then you'll move on. And these people will in time. We have a lot of people who are looking toward Christ as all right now who have not been able to shut off the outer knowledge. They will in time because it keeps telling them it don't work. It isn't real. It bombards the wisdom of Christ within them because it's not truth. And they have that, that instinct, godly instinct within them that tells them uh, that that's the way it is. A couple more words. We'll be done. Number nine, pragmatism. That has nothing to do with your glasses or... Pragmatism is saying that truth is experience. Uh, that's the atheist. That's the New Age movement. That's uh, agnosticism. It says that real truth is experience. Uh, who is Shakespeare said, be true to yourself. That's pragmatism. That, that is, if a thing proves by experience that it's good or real to you, but that's no test of the real truth. You'll never come to truth pragmatically. Now, truth in pragmatism comes out of an idea. Oh, that the, the Spirit would bear this to you because this has been what you didn't like in religion. Uh, a minister comes along and he has an idea and God blesses him. I mean, he starts with a handful of people and he builds a great church. He gets the money. He does all sorts of worldwide uh, ministry. And you have a idea, well, he's okay. Look how God's blessing him. Look what God's doing in this brother. Look what God's doing. That's what we said about religion. The most far-flung ministry in the world today was constantly growing. Swaggerts, you, you can't believe the growth of that that ministry. And so we said, well, that's good. Everybody backs it. I want my money to go where great things are being done, where, where God's really blessing. And we were pragmatically judging the truth by saying its greatness must be all right. It must be truth. Now, that's what really was behind it. That's how we get involved in a certain place. Well, God's blessing these people here, so this must be truth. No. Well, this preacher is being greatly used of God, so that must be truth. 
No. You understand? We don't come to what is truth by experience. Now this is hard on us because this brings us to the place where what is truth? You look at me and you say, well, it's truth because look at Litzman. No, sir. It is not truth because of me. You must experience what is truth by seeing Jesus. Truth is a person, not what I do or even how I'm used of God. Pragmatism is saying that truth is an experience. And you can't weigh it by that. Uh, I look at some of the most successful religions in the world and they're far from truth. Armstrongism, very successful. Lots of money. Mormonism, very successful. Probably the most successful religion on the West Coast now. But it isn't truth. So pragmatically, you cannot make experience truth any more than a husband can lie on his wife and have another woman and live with both of them for years. That's not truth. But he did have great experience and could show that this is what I do. Number 10, consistency. What is truth? Really, basically, what is truth? I'm telling you. I don't know how a fellow can get so mixed up. What is the truth about this? Consistency. Truth is when a believer knows what it is that corresponds to the mind of God. What in your life corresponds to the mind of God? What is the mind of God? Here it is. Here's the mind of God. I don't mean the scriptures. I mean the mind of God is the Christ who is the word. What corresponds to that Christ? Because you don't have the scriptures in you. You have Christ, the word in you. What corresponds to that? Two or three things I want to say about this. By consistency, we mean obedience to God's word. There is a law of contradiction. Uh, we in the church don't know much about the law of contradiction, but sinners... Uh, violate this law quite often. For instance, when people complain about religious hypocrites, what they mean really is that certain Christians say that they love Christ and do evil. And by this, they break the law of contradiction. We're all a contradiction to the world. We appear one way when we're actually another. And so consistency is us abiding by the law of contradiction. I know right off I'm a contradiction, that I appear to be something that I'm not. So whether the world sees it, and I bring this to you very often, we've got to watch that in our preaching, that we ought never to preach a message that I know it's real because he lives it. It's real whether he lives it or not. Or we say, well, if he don't live it, he's not saved. That's not so. I may never live what it is I am, and I will never live perfectly what I am in expression. But what I am stands perfect before God, and the law of contradiction is me not breaking that. When, whenever we find uh, contradiction, we can be sure that the truth is not there. That when we say one thing and do another thing, uh, the truth is not there, even though I know that he in me is perfect and my expression of him is imperfect. That's why we ought not to say, I am what I live. I need to say, I am what I am by Christ in me. You understand the difference there? I am what I am by Christ in me, not by the way I live, even though if I walk 
in the light as he's in the light or if I walk in the spirit rather than in the flesh. God is consistent. The Christ that is in you is consistent. Always consistent. Once you take hold of that, you begin to live truth. Truth hurts. My mama used to always tell me, truth hurts you. Go ahead and give it to me. And I knew that whether I gave it to her or didn't do it, it hurt me because she'd spank me either way. I had a hard time with that, you know. <laughs> tell me the truth now. Tell me the truth now. Well, my guilt won't tell the truth, but I knew if I told the truth, I wouldn't be free of the spanking. I was going to get it anyhow. <laughs> because Christ is truth, he is the source of all rationality. You'll only be an absolutely rational person when Christ as truth begins to flow out of you. John 1 and 9 tells us that God gave a rational nature to every man in the person of Christ. You love him? Amen. You see Jesus in each other? You've been such a good group today. This has to be the best group that's close to the Father's house. Amen. Terrific. We could set up a program here. All of you could bring one next Sunday. Wouldn't that be great? Why don't we leave it to the Lord? <laughs> We're moving, folks. We're moving on in Christ. We're not stop stalemated, defeated. We're just moving on. And God's given us direction and a vision, and it's coming alive. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. There's going to be a body of believers at Westport. Isn't that something? Amen. I sensed that yesterday. Amen. And you know what's so precious? We, we are consistent in what we're doing. I told you that from the beginning, that it isn't how much we do, but to be faithful in what we do, that God will work out of that faithfulness, Christ. Well, I don't think Ernie's ever missed a beat since he started. Have you noticed that? <laughs> don't want to miss it. <laughs> he and Mary have never missed a beat. And I see now, it looked like nothing ever happened, but did. The dream, the vision of this brother has materialized over there. And, and oh, I'm anxious for you to meet that pastor. I never met a more precious man. So in our consistency, God's going to move. You see, he's beginning to move. And I see new hearts here that God's got a hold of, and he's going to use you. He is you. So let's move on. Praise God.